K. So two cents about the, the exam that was on Monday. I, I did put out the booklets. There, there are a tiny number of you who still are taking the exam. But I put the booklets out uh, on this, the literature racks out in this long hallway for those who have taken the exam. And I encourage you to pick it up. To I, I sent emails with your scores. I sent emails with your choices and the answers on your booklet. And particularly for those of you who didn't do as well as you'd like, use it as a learning experience. Look at your, the answers you got wrong. Figure out why you got them wrong. Wait a week. Take the exam again. See whether you learn from it. Come and talk to me about things you don't understand. Um, in preparation, the final, I'll tell you, I'll remind you, the finals is, is, well, it's what, December 14th. It's way off in the distance. However, we'll be working our way through the material, and you can actually take, you can start looking at it now. Um, look at the old ones. Now, it's 60 questions, so it's twice as big as the midterm. I think of it as the third midterm is 30 of the questions, and the other 30 are just open season across the semester. So it'll be the same concept, uh, you know, the same kind of questions you've seen before in class. In fact, you'll see questions you've seen before. So I, I truly encourage you to learn from, from things you didn't get right. Any, any questions about exam stuff? I still haven't fixed my gadget to have you send me messages, so I, anyway, I, I'll, I'll get it going by Friday. All right. So where things left off is talking about the interactions of, of fluids and, and objects, balls. So balls and air and the, all, all the story there. And you know, as, as just to remind you, that, that balls, the air has got such a low viscosity that it's very hard to keep it from going turbulent. So basically all the balls that move through air, all the sports balls, and most other objects that move through the air uh, experience turbulence behind them. They leave a turbulent wake behind them. And as a result, they experience pressure drag, which is the drag that shows up when you have the air encounters the front of the object nicely and develops a high pressure there. And then it leaves a turbulent wake, which is basically atmospheric pressure behind it. So it's got this imbalance between high pressure in front and ordinary pressure behind. With that in mind, um, I thought I would show you a, a tidbit of, of somewhat of, of television from back in the day. And there it is. And Now John, myth number four. Myth number four. I heard this one when I was a kid. So and now John, myth number four. Myth number four. I heard this one when I was a kid. A penny dropped from the top of the Empire State Building could kill a pedestrian below. People at the Empire State Building thought it would. Anybody who gets hit by that penny is about to die, because that's a long way for a penny to fall. And people here agree. Oh, it'd kill them. For sure. If it hit the ground hard enough, it might flatten out into a quarter or something. <laughs> Those people were standing at the top of America's tallest building, the Sears Tower in Chicago. If it hit somebody, I think it'd really hurt them. Stupid penny. penny. That's what happens in this Tony Award winning musical. The puppet throws a penny off the top of the Empire State Building and strikes her romantic rival below, breaking her neck. What happened to her? Some idiot threw a penny off the Empire State Building. I heard that the penny would go through someone's head. People said it would be like a bullet. It would kill you. <laughs> They're thinking of a world without air. Physicist Lou Bloomfield. I spray painted my hair brown. It's a big deal for little things. It, it slows down leaves, it slows down raindrops, and it slows down pennies. But a penny is heavier than a raindrop. They catch a lot of wind, very unstable in the air, and it just flutters. Bloomfield tackles the penny myth in his book, How Everything Works. We kept hearing about pennies. They dent the sidewalk. Well, it's, it's human intuition. You think, whatever it is I'm holding is up there at the Empire State Building. This is really bad news. I've always heard if you drop a penny from this high up, it would clearly uh, kill someone. Not a pleasant thought. Don't no. want to try it, but it would be kind of interesting to find out. It would, but how would you test it? The ideal thing would be to, to drop a penny off the Empire State Building and catch it. But sadly, no building will let us do this because they're all worried about the myth. So at our request, Bloomfield concocted another test. He filled this balloon with helium and attached a penny dispenser to it. It just spits out one penny at a time. He launched the balloon hundreds of feet into the air, 
Then a remote control device released the pennies and he ran around trying to catch them. <laughs> I bounced off my hand. It bounced off my hand again. You never did catch it. I didn't catch it because I'm a oh. bad catch. And it was a windy day. Oh, yeah. Where'd it go? Oh! <laughs> it surprised me! Did you catch that? It hit me, it hit me right in the chin. It was noticeable, but nothing more. I was just disappointed I hadn't caught the thing. So a penny won't hurt me, but you don't want people throwing things off tall buildings. Other things would hurt. That's right. If they're aerodynamically streamlined, something like a ballpoint pen, they'll reach the point at which they're going a couple hundred miles an hour, and that's dangerous. Don't dump your handbag out the top of a building. Something in that bag is likely to go awfully fast. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yes, it, it, the fun opportunities like that pop up from time to time, and so somehow I ended up being like the expert on falling pennies. And you know, you know why they come down so slowly. They develop terrible pressure drag as they're fluttering around. They have this big turbulent wake behind them, and they come down at about 25 miles an hour, which I actually measured. So like sometimes physicists measure stuff that's I wouldn't say practical, but, but sort of common stuff. Uh, so anyway, streamline. Um, the difference between, say, a penny, or equivalently a, a baseball, and an airplane is in the streamline character of an airplane. Um, so the topic, the, the topic I'll do initially today, and I'll, and I'll make pretty fast progress through it, is how an airplane flies. And you already know most of the issues. Uh, for the airplane to fly, it first off needs to have relatively, uh, well, for, for, it needs to deflect the air downward. The only thing that's going to hold it in the air is the air. And it also then needs to not have other problems flying that would slow it, it down. So let me actually ask you a question. I, start, I got lazy on doing these. Let me bring this one up. And it's one that, that some of you have seen on some of the old exams, actually, and asked me about. So here's, here's the question. And it says that, that if an airplane flies horizontally through, through stationary air, um, what does it leave behind it, basically, in the air? What's the air doing after the plane goes by? So you've seen this, actually, you've seen this happen countless times. You look up in the sky, and you see a, a plane going by, straight and true through the air. Um, Constant velocity, which way does it leave the air behind it? What, what does it leave the air behind it doing? You okay with the question? Any questions about the question? Okay, let, let me turn on the widget here. Get that out of here. Ready? Okay, it's active. Someone calling in with an answer. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll give you till the 30 second point. Yay! C it is. I don't know about E, but C is definitely the right answer. The air is left moving downward, purely downward. It's a little bit of a stunning result because you think that the, the plane will be dragging air along or pushing it, f uh, uh, pushing it backward or some other complicated possibility. But no, it's just downward. And the reason for it being just downward is that the, the plane is moving at constant velocity, which means the net force on it is zero. And you know it's got a weight downward so that everything else pushing on it which is the air, has to be just canceling weight. So it has to be pushing it straight up. That doesn't mean that there's only one force on the plane. There are actually three important kinds of forces on the plane. One of them is straight up, and that's, that's the lift force. The plane is developing lift by, push, by deflecting the air stream downward. So I'll, I'll go there in a second. There's also a backward force on the plane, which is now familiar because of uh, talking about balls in air, pressure drag, 
or drag in general? Air resistance. And the third force of air on the plane is a thrust force. It's a forward force on the plane that comes about because the plane is not passive. It's got either propellers or jet engines, something that is grabbing the air and throwing it backward. So in effect, the plane is swimming through the air by grabbing air, throwing it backward, grabbing air, throwing it backward. It's a little more complicated than doing it with your hands, but it's, that's the idea. So there's sort of three forces to look at in an airplane. Um, the lift force that supports it, the drag force that, make, that, that makes it struggle a little to keep going forward, and the thrust force that, does key, that manages to overcome the air resistance and, or cancel the air resistance and, and allow it to continue to coast forward. So that's where I'm going to go. And I'm turn this off. Now I'll, I'll actually pop that slide up there. Uh, in, an, in an airplane, so as it's moving through the air, to look at the first, I'll, I'll look at the drag force first just for a second. The plane is, planes are designed to be, to develop as little pressure drag as possible. And how do you do that? Don't, you know, don't make it like a penny. Make it like a ballpoint pen. Design it so that the air encounters the front, bends away, develops the high pressure at the front. That's okay, you can live with it for the moment. It goes around the plane, sometimes it may bend toward the plane, but in particular around the wings, the air is, is, is it develops a little bit of high pressure in front, it goes around the wings, develops some low pressures in the interesting places, but it keeps attached to the surface as long as possible. It tries not to break away into a turbulent wake. And ultimately, it, it does, the plane does leave behind some amount of turbulent wake, but not very much. Re actually, remarkably little. It's very carefully engineered to leave as little a turbulent wake as possible. The main turbulent wake that it does leave actually will come off the wingtips. And I'll, I'll try to say two cents about those. But for the most part, it leaves very little turbulence behind it, which is great. That means that the, the pressure drag on it's tiny. Nonetheless, there is some drag, and it has to compensate for that by, by getting a thrust force forward, which is the last thing I'll talk about. But let me come back then to the, 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 sec, the other force, which is the lift force. As the air goes past the plane, the, the job of the wings is to deflect that air downward. And you can think of it two different ways. Um, one is sort of the Newtonian, it's described, or considered to be the Newtonian explanation. The other is the Bernoullian explanation. Newtonian first, just because it's simple. If the air is coming along and by virtue of just forces, you just you think of the, pl the plane's wing a little bit as a ramp, which is an oversimplification for sure. It takes the air encountering that wing and runs it down the ramp and the air leaves heading downward. And that ramp is basically pushing the air downward. So this is why it's Newton, Newtonian view, is that, that the plane's job, the wing's job, is just to push the air downward. And Newton's third law, the air pushes upward on the wing. Mission accomplished. You got lift, OK? It is an oversimplification. I'll come back in a moment to, to that. The Bernoullian view is in terms of the airflow and the exchange of energy from pressure potential energy to kinetic energy and back again, and the differences in pressures that develop, and ultimately that you get a pressure imbalance across the wing. The, the airplane develops high pressure below it, below the, each wing. So, so the force up on the wing is, is big. It also develops low pressure on the top of the wing. So the pressure down on the wing is small. There's a net pressure imbalance across the wing in the upward direction. And that creates the lift force. So that's the, that's the Bernoulli and sophisticated think about pressures and the exchanges of energy in, in the airflow. Ultimately, the two, are, the two interpretations or, or, or concepts are the same. They, they share the same only underlying physics. Um, they're ha they're, well, at least there used to be sort of these tempests in a teapot on the web of people arguing for one of the views over the other, and it's all hooey. They're, they're equivalent. The, the key thing is that the, plane, the plane's wing does develop lift for good reasons that have to do with both the shape of the, of the wing, if you slice through the wing. What I've, what I've got drawn up here, if this guy will wake up, am I going to get it? Nope, not today. All right, try red. Okay, 
the, the, the shape of the wing uh, in, in some cases is, is carefully engineered. This one's a symmetric wing. It's the, the top and the bottom are the same, but sometimes it's engineered so that it's got different curvature on the top and the bottom. That's part of the story. The other part of the story is the tilt of the wing, what's called the angle of attack. Uh, in, in a plane that's, in a wing that's developing lift, wings don't always have to develop lift. They can just walk, they can go straight through the air and, and they don't deflect the air at all. Just, they just slice. But if they tip like this, so they have uh, that, that angle from horizontal to, to tipped is called angle of attack. Now they, they change the airflow. The airflow above and below the wing is different. And here's the story. The airflow, in this case, the air is, oh, don't do this to me. You get what you pay for. I paid almost nothing for them and I got exactly almost nothing. So in they come. The air, the air, was, the air for, the, for this plane is, was coming along horizontally. And the airflow that develops around the wing is, is, is startling, startlingly reshaped by the presence of the wing. And it's reshaped even, in, even ahead of the wing. So, so the air starts, starts knowing the wing is coming early. And it's beginning to swoop up toward the wing as it approaches. And there are two parts to the airflow separated by this, this line that I've got here that, just, that hits the link, wing. It's, it's a hypothetical line. There's really no air in that. It's, it's, but it's, it's, it divides the airflow above the wing from the airflow below the wing. And let's look at each of those. The airflow ab below the wing encounters the wing and bends away from it. Rather than going through it, it bends away. And by now you should know. How do you get air to, flow, to bend away from a surface? have high pressure at the surface. It's atmospheric far away from the wing, so the pressure under the wing is above atmospheric. And I, I show that with the, the violet end of the spectrum, high pressure. That's my, my convention is high pressure is the violet end of the spectrum. Um, the airflow over the wing makes a weird inward curve. It actually bends a little bit forward, arcs around the wing, and it's always bending toward the wing. Therefore, it's being pushed toward the wing. How do you have that happen? Again, pressure imbalance. It's atmospheric, far from the wing. To get the air to arc toward the wing, it must be lower than atmospheric, above the wing. So that's the whole Bernoullian story, really. Those, if you look at the pressure below the wing, it's above atmospheric pressure. If you look at the air, uh, airflow over the wing, it's below atmospheric pressure. There's a net pressure, there's a pressure imbalance across the wing, and it pushes the wing upward. And that's this lift force that, I, that I've marked there. Uh, it, it does instantly develop, the, 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 the obtaining lift has a cost. If you deflect the air, air stream downward, which, which is what's happening here, you give the air stream some energy. And that energy comes out of the wing. And it comes out in, in the form of a, of a drag force. The wing with nothing else helping it, the wing will slow down because it's using some of its energy to deflect the air and give the air energy. So a lifting wing has, has a type of drag that's got a new name and you don't have to remember it. It's called induced drag. It's there. I don't, I'm never going to hold you to it. But uh, you, you do get that drag. So the main thing is that the, the, the wing gets this upward lift force. And it gets it by bending the air away from the bottom of the wing and toward the top of the wing. Any questions about that idea? Virtually everything else in the story is details. Uh, let me, however, ask you one more thing about, or one more question. And this has to do with that, that angle of attack. I, I, I showed you that, that part of the reason that the plane gets, the wings get lift is because they're tilted as into the up, they're tilted upward. So the onrushing air encounters them at an angle. Why can't you just keep going to higher and higher angle to get more and more lift? That's the question here. You okay with the idea? Or you know, okay with the question? See what you think. As you'll see, this is, this is alas, very relevant at the moment. You know, it, I'll give you another 10 seconds. 
you're, and you're, you're, I'll give you the 30 seconds. You're allowed to talk among yourselves, you know, chit chat it out. Five, four, three, two, one. Be it is. So most of you got it, which is great. And so, here, so here's a turbulence. The problem is, if you keep tilting the wing, so the wing was, was flying along, it's deflecting the air more and 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 more, and more until finally it's flying like this, it's not streamlined anymore. If it's going through the air like this, it's blunt. It's a box, it's, or it's, it's a plate going through the air. It will develop turbulence behind the wing which is to say that the, that that smooth flow of air over the top of the wing that I that I said you wanted to be streamlined it will not do it it will break away and you'll end up with turbulent air pocket behind it and why is this relevant uh, the current I, I try to stay out of the news but 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 there are issues with a plane you know, planes uh, the, 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 the 737 max there were two crashes right and where did the crashes came, come from they came from the following, as best I remember it, I'm, you know, again, I'm trying not, not to pay, whatever. <sighs> Planes are very cautious about tilting too much, particularly at, at, when they tilt too much, they, they r risk having the airflow break away from their top surface of their wings, a phenomenon known as stalling. Planes do not want to stall their wings. Um, if you stall the wings, you lose lift and you develop pressure drag. So the plane goes from flying along nicely to suddenly just essentially slowing down abruptly and descending like crazy. And what I'm hesitating on is, is, is I don't want to step on anybody's bad experiences. I did step on a woman's, you know, maybe 10 years ago. A woman sitting out there had lost her father that spring to stalling in a small private plane. So I hope I'm not heading, getting any small planes. The crashes that occur in small planes are very frequently caused by stalling. Why? Because the plane flies best at high speed. All the planes do. At, at high speed, you, planes encounter lots of air. They deflect it even gently, and they get lots of lift. It's great. They don't need much angle attack. Hunky-dory. At low speeds, which are frequently dealt with during takeoffs and landings. Planes take off and land at less than their normal cruising speed. At lower speed, it's harder to get as much lift because you got, you're not encountering so much air every second. So you got to uh, uh, compensate for it by tilting. They go to higher angles of attack. And so during landings and takeoffs, they're risking they're, they're, they come closer to the stalling condition than they do during normal flight. Planes rarely stall at, at cruising, while cruising. They do occasionally stall during takeoffs and landings, and that's often at low altitude, so there's not much time to correct for it. If you, if you stall at a 30,000 feet, no problem. There's plenty of time to fix, the, fix it. Um, there, there were early on, early flight, people would stall one wing, and they would get into what's called a tailspin, where they lose lift over one wing and the other wing is still going and they're kind of going around in a weird circle. And those were, they, they were fatal until people figured out how to solve the problem, which was basically to just, just, just uh, point in the direction of, of, of the decline, basically dive, and let the air start flowing over the wings again properly and then pull out of the dive. At high altitude, no trouble. It's at the low altitudes you run into real problems. So, Back to the, the, the 737 MAX problem. There are, there are all modern airplanes have sensors for stall conditions. They're looking for that, for the breakaway of the airflow. And then if they, if they do that, at the very least, they sound an alarm. In some of the modern planes, they automatically tip the nose of the plane down, get out of the stall, avoid the stall. And the planes, the two crashes were because the automatic system sensed stall when it was not present, it was a mistake, and cause the plane to tip nose down, and terrible disaster. So um, for those of you who have ever fl flown, flown in planes or have flown planes, you, 
you, you, this is, it's just one of the things, part, parts of life in an airplane, you just avoid stalling. And um, it's worth knowing that it exists. All right. Any questions, thoughts at this point? Okay. I talked about drag forces. I talked about lift forces in the plane. Um, a, few, a few cents about, about planes that you, commercial planes you've flown in. Um, planes that go very fast, jet, jet aircraft, uh, and I'll talk only briefly about the engines. This is obviously not a jet aircraft, but this has some of the features of a, of a more sophisticated plane than the Styrofoam model. The plane, the plane as it flies along, um, as it goes faster, I mean, uh, yeah, commercial planes, I, I'm heading in three directions in my head at once. Let's bring them all together. Commercial planes, you've, if, you've, if you've flown on one, you've noticed that at takeoff and at landing, it, the, the, the wings are enlarged. They send out slats and flaps and make the wing larger. Uh, and why do they do that? To get more lift at low speed. So a commercial aircraft can get tons of lift at, at high speed, even with a small wing. So they, they don't need much wing. But during takeoff and landing, they need more wing because they're not encountering as much air every second. So they actually extend parts of the wing to give them more surface area and more curvature often to get more lift from the, from the air. Uh, uh, I would say toy planes. This is really a toy plane. But a, but a planes that, that you just rent at the airport or whatever, the propeller and stuff, they don't go all that fast. Therefore, they need bigger wings and more curvature in the wings to get the lift that they need to support themselves. And they don't bother changing the shape of the wing. That's, 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 for, that's for the big boys. Um, how do they steer? The way, they, the way that you steer a plane, you, you, know, you can get the lift by tipping the nose high and having the properly shaped wings. But if you want to, if I want this plane to steer towards you, how do I do that? Well, early on, people thought that planes might steer by rudder. So that basically, if you turn the plane toward you, it'll fly toward you. But that's not, I mean, that works in a boat. It doesn't work in a plane. What you want to do to make a plane turn towards you is you want to use the lift force to accelerate you horizontally. How do you do that? Make sure the lift force isn't straight up anymore. Tip the plane. If you tip the plane like this, the lift force it's obtaining from the passage of air around the wings is no longer straight up, it's up and toward you. And the part that's toward you will make it accelerate toward you. Uh, the rest of the hardware, the, ba the back in there, is really to try to make sure that as the plane accelerates toward you, it doesn't end up flying kind of sideways. It, you, you don't want the plane accelerating toward you and flying like this. So how do you fix that? Rotate the, the plane so that it, that it is always sort of pointing into the oncoming air. And you rotate with this back here. So if you look back at the history of aviation, the, the, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur, working on this, they were learning how to, how to develop the turn by, by using the tilt of the plane, and then how to aim the plane into the onrushing wind with the, with the surfaces in the back. They're, they're using wings and the passage of air past those wings to develop lift forces that orient the plane as well as, as lift it. And it's, I mean, they're long stories. And, and uh, I'll probably leave it, leave it as that, except for the propulsion. So I, why, why I'm holding this guy is because this, this toy plane has what are called ailerons here that are able to tilt. I guess I can, I can force them to happen there. Can you see the back surfaces tilting? That is what allows the plane to, to, to go to one side or the other. If, the, if it tilts like this, the air going past that, that final portion of wing is kicked up. That means the air pushes down. This will tip the wing this way. The plane's got a torque on it now. If I rotate it this way, this pairing, the air that's going over this wing is kicked up. This wing is shoved down. So next time you fly in a plane, if you do, Wash out the windows for what's going on in the wings. The wings are being, the, the ailerons, you'll, you'll see the, these, these, la, these uh, trailing surfaces moving up and down, trying to orient the plane the way they want it. In, in normal flight, of course, they want to keep it horizontal. But during turns, they're deliberately putting it wing low. They, put, they lower the wing on, on the inside of the turn to, to use the lift to do the turn. Is that OK? 
Uh, the, the surfaces back here in the elevator or in the, in the vertical stabilizer, those are in, involved in, in orienting the plane up and down. To, to how much lift do you want? They use the, the rear elevator for that. And to, to aim into the onrushing wind, they use the vertical stabilizer. But that's enough detail. Let me just say about propellers and jet engines, and then just be done with it and get on to other things that are more important, as you'll see. The propeller's job is to, to make up for, at the very least, to make up for, the, uh, compensate for the, for, for the drag force on the plane. The plane is being pushed backwards and therefore would, would lose momentum if nothing helped. So the propeller's job is to, is to get more forward momentum. How does it do that? By giving the passing air backward momentum. It, as it spins, it's grabbing the air in effect and throwing it backward. Giving it backward momentum, the air pushes back and gives the plane forward momentum. Simple as that. The propeller, just a point out, uh, modern propeller is basically an invention of Orville, Orville Wright. Prior to, to his, his work, you, know, you, th you think the Wright brothers, you may, you may hear about them as, as just two bicycle mechanics in Dayton, Ohio, but they were among the most sophisticated aerodynamicists of their day. And, and it, sort of, uh, they're not at a university, they're just, just two guys in a shed thinking hard. And Orville figured out that a propeller is actually a rotating wing. It has all the characteristics of a wing. The air goes over one surface, goes over the other surface. You want high pressure on one, low pressure on the other. And once, he, once the t they, they came up with a properly shaped propeller, as opposed to just paddles going through the air, um, ramps going through the air, once they started making wing-shaped propellers, um, they got, the, they got the forward force they needed to fly a plane under power. So that's, you know, why did they succeed when everybody else had failed? Because they had proper, properly designed propellers. Jet engines are more sophisticated yet than propellers. Propellers have the disadvantage of they're, they're trying to work in the passing air at full speed. So the air's coming by them. The plane's flying 200 miles an hour. The propeller is basically grabbing 200 mile an hour headwind air and trying to throw it backward. Well, if you're, if you're a swimmer, it's easy to swim in motionless water. But if the water's coming at you at 200 miles an hour, you're not gonna be able to get much forward propulsion by grabbing it and throwing it backward. So the propeller's got, it basically runs out of oomph at a couple hundred miles an hour. It can't keep up with the onrushing air. So what do you do? Send the air into a duct that is a diffuser. Remember what diffusers do. Diffusers are anti-nozzles. You take the air coming in, you spread it out, it slows down and its pressure builds. That's a good thing. If you're at 30,000 feet, the pressure's pretty wimpy. And if you're flying at 600 miles an hour, the air's coming at you pretty fast. So slow it down to 200 miles an hour, let its pressure build up to five times what it normally is. You now have high pressure air to work with, which is good, and it's dense. And it's not moving all that fast. So Jet engines take the air in, slow it down in a duct, add energy to it, and throw it out the back with more momentum than it, uh, than, than it with extra backward momentum, and they get propelled forward. Uh, last thing I'll say about engines is that the way they add energy and, and send it out the back is with a roaring bonfire. So inside that passive looking engine there, you might hear a little whir going on. I guess I can show you a picture of this thing. Yeah, they're, they're adding fuel. They're adding fuel to the passing air, uh, which they've pressurized with not only the, the duct, but, but uh, compressors. They, they put fuel in it and burn it. It's, it's just a, a raging inferno inside that engine. And what's coming out it has lost the inferno, but it's, uh, it, it's invisible in the commercial, commercial aircraft. Uh, in the military aircraft, sometimes you actually see the flames coming out of the, out of the engine, but it's quite a, it, inside it's quite something. Okay? Quick exploration of, of airplanes. Any questions about airplanes, things that, that are on your mind? All right. Where I want to go, and I'm going to do it briefly, um, that is, wood stoves, let me get this out of here. So, so the next, we're, we're gonna leave it, the, the world of fluids, you know, we'll never, we won't leave fluids forever, but, but 
I'm done talking about fluids, you know, air flow, water flow, things moving through air, moving through water. And we'll shift gears to looking at heat and thermal energy and stuff. Um, I will tell you, technically, objects contain thermal energy, and they transfer the thermal energy via heat. heat so heat is thermal energy on the move. We, we saw how uh, to move energy around, ordinary energy around. You do it by, by doing work on things. So I can give energy to this table by doing work on it. Of course, I have trouble because it won't move. To do work on it, I have to exert a force on it, and it has to move a distance in the direction of the force. Um, I can, however, transfer energy to it by heat. Heat's a little different. It actually, it, it's not totally different. If you go down at the microscopic level, it's, it's little pieces of work. But heat flows from hot objects to cold objects. It does that naturally. You, it's something you've watched happen or been involved in your whole life. Um, Heat is energy flowing from a hot object to a cold object. It's thermal energy, okay? I'm looking for a segue into what I'm going to go into, which is not, not a lot of physics, but we're going to, since it's just after the exam, right, anything's okay. And any excuse for liquid nitrogen is a good excuse. Remember that story? So. We are going to let heat flow from warm cream and milk and sugar and vanilla and chocolate, perhaps, into cold liquid nitrogen. So I got I to justify this somehow. Liquid nitrogen, of course, is a very cold liquid that is basically ordinary air, getting rid of everything but the nitrogen, condensing it into a liquid that's a very cold. And Heat will naturally flow from anything in this room into that liquid nitrogen because everything else is hotter. Uh, I should, you know, I'll say, temperature measures a characteristic of the thermal energy in, in, in objects. But temperature also tells you which way heat will flow given, its, given an opportunity. Heat always flows in, in normal natural circumstances. It always flows from the, uh, the object with a higher temperature than, a, than uh, to the, the object with a lower temperature. Uh, that in, to some extent defines what a temperature is. So if you, if you measure the temperatures of everything in this room, you could then tell me which objects would, would lose heat to the, which other objects. That flow of heat from hot to cold happens because of statistics. It's statistically likely for heat to flow from hot to cold and extremely unlikely to go the other way. And we'll do more of that down the road. But having talked this to death, I need two cooking crews of two to, to make liquid nitrogen ice cream. Can I have four volunteers? Two, two, two and two? You guys, get, great. And two, uh, two more. Sorry. OK. You guys get this bowl. You get this bowl. And here, so here's the idea. And, uh, you, you guys can dump all that in there. Same here. Go ahead and empty the, all, the whole mess in there. All right. And that's going to be about enough sugar there. I measure carefully. <laughs> Okay, and and vanilla, and you guys have a have a role to play in this, as you can imagine. All right. Anybody interested in, in chocolate as opposed to vanilla? <laughs> Who's up to be the chocolate makers? OK, you guys get to be the chocolate maker. Um, you can add it judiciously. I'm not sure how much. OK, so now the active ingredient, of course. And because it's, it, it's a very cold liquid that is nitrogen gas, it will, oh, I got to give you spoons. One, one spoon each. 
Um, I will add it because if you add it too fast, it's major boil over trouble. So you guys can supervise the, ad, the, the, the mixing here. Um, you can t take turns, whatever. If I add it too fast, it's a disaster. So I gotta go, but you guys can just stir it. Here it comes in. That ought, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I got to do some ha ha ha's myself, actually. Let's see. Yeah. If I pour it on the floor, it's like hot grease. It's like, like uh, hot water on a hot griddle pan. So it skittles around, picking up dirt. And I have to end up adding about, this is about a gallon of ice cream in each bin. I have to add about a gallon of liquid nitrogen to each one. Oh, I overdid it. Oh, I did. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> Slight mistake. Oh, it, yeah, it is safe to eat because what does the nitrogen liquid turn into? Nitrogen gas, which a, a lot of ice cream, the, the premium ice creams, are pretty light because they have a lot of air whipped into them. So this sort of spontaneously whips air into it. We're getting pretty close. We did not add enough chocolate. You can add more, was there enough, you know, yeah, you're welcome to add more chocolate. And they could have gotten ambitious and melted real chocolate, but it's a little ambitious. Yeah, sure. Uh -oh. Is it starting to get stiff? Yeah. I think we got a little bit more to go, but not much. Is it, yeah, you guys can, can tell me when to stop, because it's going to get, it'll get sti pretty stiff. We want to go a little past what you think is right, because it'll take a while for everybody to get served, but. <laughs> Are we there yet? Or it's still going? It's pretty stiff. Take it a little farther just so it doesn't melt well. A lot of ice cream has stuff in it that keeps it semi-solid even as it's melting. This, of course, doesn't. It's just like, you've seen all the ingredients that went into it. So it easily turns into soup if we're, if, as it warms up, for better or worse. Is that good enough to serve? Uh, yeah, <laughs> amateur. We're all amateur chefs here, right? It's a molecular gastronomy, this is. OK, we're, we're probably at the point where, where it's servable. So class is done for the day. We'll convene on Friday. In the meantime, spoons, cups, you all can figure out how to serve yourselves. You know. <laughs> Yeah, go for it. <laughs>